in the last lecture we, we talked about um, you know how the atomizers well they are essential you know to cause the atomization of the sample in atomic spectroscopy you know they also cause you know this problem you know referred to as the background now you, you, you're gonna find in an ideal setting, you know, ideally your signal, you, you know, um, as a function of time, you know, should look, you know, like that. Now, meaning that when there is no, um, you, you know, analyte or when there is the blank, you know, you essentially, you know, have a signal being equals to, signal being equals to zero. However, we know that's not really the case. You know, because in real life, you know, typically you've got a situation, you know, that looks like that. Meaning, even when you're running the blank, you know, there is still a little bit, you know, of signal that is related uh, to the blank. And this signal of the blank often is largely, you know, because of these kinds of effects, um, you know, from, uh, the la uh, from the laser, if at all, is a light source. Uh, from uh, from the flame, if at all you're dealing with the AAS, for example, or flame AA, uh, or, or even, you know, something like um, the, 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 the plasma, if at all you're dealing with uh, ICP. So, of course, you would see that situation like this um, really affect your signal-to-noise ratio, uh, which obviously, you know, affects your limit of detection. Your limit of detection gets affected, you know, because of that situation. So as an instrument, you know, manufacturer, you really need a way to correct uh, for a uh, background uh, correction, you know, in your instrument. Now, we're going to discuss, you know, different ways of doing background correction when you're doing atomic uh, spectroscopy. And one very common way of correcting for background related um, uh, to the flame, for example, is by simply modulating, you know, your light source. So, so if at all you've got your light source there, of course, remember, that is a hollow cathode lamp in the case of uh, AAS is the most common. Uh, you can modulate the lamp such that uh, you are pulsating it, you know, meaning you are switching it on and off. And in that case, you know, when it is on, you, you know, then you are really detecting uh, both uh, the matrix or, 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 or the background, you know, as well as uh, the signal. And while it's off, you know, you're only really detecting the background. And when you subtract the two, you know, then you're only going to get your signal. Another approach, you know, of modulating is, is where you just simply have a chopper. It's still a method of modulating, really, where you've got a chopper, a beam chopper, you know, that is able to block, you know, the light, you know, from the flame. Meaning at one point, you know, you block the lamp, you know, from, uh, you know, from getting to the flame. And so in that case, you know, the detector here is going to only be detecting, you know, the signal from the flame. Okay. So when the lamp is off or is blocked, you know, the detector is only detecting, you know, the signal from the flame. You know, when the lamp is on or is not blocked, you know, you're detecting the signal from the flame as well as, you know, the signal, you know, from the light source, you know, from the hollow cathode lamp, you know, and essentially this is the analyte signal. Okay. And, of course, this one is a, is a matrix, you know, signal. And so if you subtract this, you know, from this, you know, then you're only going to get your analyte signal. I hope you, you've seen how it works. You know, when you block, um, you know, the light source, you're only detecting uh, the analyte as well as the matrix or the background. And when the light source is on, you're detecting both. You know, and as such, if you subtract the two, you're only going to get uh, the analyte signal. Another method, you know, of uh, doing background correction is where you've got two light sources, okay? So you've got the hollow cathode lamp, you know, which is sort of your analytical, 
you know, light source, but you also have, you know, a continuum type of light source, something like deuterium. Now remember, you know, these one, the holocarta lamp, is a line source. Is a line source. You know, whereas, you know, the deuterium, you know, is continuum, you know, meaning, you know, of course, you know, the wavelength is fairly broad, you know, so this one is a continuum, you know, the continuum light source. And so at one point, you know, you can have a rotating chopper here, you know, that blocks the light, you know, from the deuterium, you know, meaning your uh, atomizer here, where your sample is, it, um, uh, it, it, it's only being uh, perturbed um, or impeded really by the line source and in that case you are detecting you know the signal you know from the analyte you know plus you know also the signal you know from the matrix okay now when you rotate the beam chopper on the other hand you know such that the deuterium now is the one that is passing through the atomizer in that case you know because of the continuum you're going to be detecting largely you know the matrix effects because remember you know the analyte is only responsive in a very very narrow uh, wavelength range meaning it's only going to be almost negligible if at all you've got a continuum light source. So with a continuum light source, when it is on, you'll be detecting really, you know, the matrix rather than, you know, the analyte. And so if you subtract the two, you know, then you're actually going to get your analyte signal. And as such, you know, it's a way to correct, you know, for the background. So this is very, very common. You know, you're going to find actually lots of different instrumentation use also this type of background correction where you've got two light sources. One of it, you know, is a holocarta lab and the other one, you know, is a continuum, you know, that's largely going to detect, you know, the, 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 the background that is coming from, uh, from, the, uh, from the matrices in the atomizer. And another method of doing background correction, you know, is what they call the Z-min effect. And I think I mentioned about it, you know, previously when we were talking about band broadening. Now, the way the Z-min effect works, you know, it's where you've got, um, uh, in this case, um, you know, you've got uh, the, the, the um, you've got the furnace. And in this furnace, you know, you expose it, you know, to... A magnetic field. So if you expose this, you know, to a huge magnetic field, we know that based on the Zeeman effect, if the magnetic field is on, it tends to split, you know, the line source into a continuum. It tends to split it into a continuum, meaning when the B or, or the magnet, you know, is on, essentially, you know, you've got the holocardal lamp being converted sort of to a continuum to a continuum a light source okay and so in that case really you'll be detecting or the detector here will be detecting uh, the signal you know from the analyte but also it's going to be detecting the matrix and remember the matrix is what is causing you know the background when the b is off you know, essentially you'll be operating it in a regular fashion, meaning the holocarta lamp is going to be a, a, a line source. And so in that case, you know, you're going to be detecting, you're going to be detecting, um, I think I confused you in this case, sorry. You know, when the, when, when the B is on, you know, holocarta lamp, you know, is going to be a continuum. And so in that case, you're going to be largely detecting the matrix. You know, when the B is off, you know, because it's a uh, line source, you, you know, you don't get that splitting effect. And, and so in that case, you'll be detecting, you know, both the matrix and you'll be detecting also, you know, the analyte as well. Okay, because this one is a line source. And so if you subtract this, you know, from when the B, you know, in this case, the magnetic field is on, sometimes people call it, uh, symbolize it with this B, when the magnetic field is on, you know, you'll be detecting just the matrix, and when you subtract the two, then, you know, you're actually just going to get, you know, the analyte signal. So I hope it's fairly clear. 
Again, when the magnetic field is on, you are converting the hollow cathode lab into a continuum because of the Zeeman effect, you know, that splitting effect, you know, of a spectral line into a continuum, uh, you, you, you know, light source, you know, because of the splitting effect um, as a result of the magnetic field. And as I said, you'll be detecting in that case, you know, the matrix. And when the B is off, you know, the hollow cathode lamp is a line source, meaning it's going to be detecting or the detector is going to be detecting the matrices as well as uh, the analyte signal. And so if you subtract the two, you know, you actually uh, get uh, the analyte signal. And essentially that is what I have uh, right here. So that's another way actually of doing background correction. And if you look at the literature, you know, you're going to see that there are lots of instrument manufacturers, you, you know, that actually use this method, you know, of background correction. But we know, you, you know, that another approach, you know, to correct, you know, for chemical matrices, just to remind you, of, of, of course, in the previous slide, we were talking about um, the, the background correction as a result, you know, of stuff that are happening within the flame. Okay. But if at all there are stuff that are present, you know, in your, in your sample, you know, of course we refer to that as chemical interferences, you know, which you, you guys know much well about. For example, when you're analyzing copper in beer, you know, you've got other matrices in beer, you know, such as sugars, you know, and, and, and so on. And of course, you know, those types of matrices are going to interfere, you know, with the analyte as well. In fact, other than the sugars, you would expect things like phosphates to be present in beer, you know, things like sulfates, you know, and, and, and so on. And, and, and we know these types of anions, you know, tend to bind to the cations, you know, that often you are interested in. If at all you are interested, say, in lead, if at all you've got sulfates there, you know, they tend to create uh, lead sulfate. And it's very difficult, you know, to actually break down lead sulfate, you know, just because, you know, you need very, very high temperatures. They tend to be very, very non-volatile, meaning, you know, they are not being atomized, meaning that you are getting, you know, suppression or signal suppression because you are not able to break down the recalcitrant, um, you, you, you know, um, salts that result from you know, this uh, re reaction of the anions plus the cations. And so the way you solve, you know, for some of these chemical matrices that are present in your sample is, for example, you can use the so-called releasing agents. And releasing agents, you know, are typically used, for example, in this case, you're analyzing for, say, calcium in whatever, maybe in a water sample, and, and we know that water sample probably can contain some sulfates, it can contain some phosphates, if at all it's a wastewater, for example. And so you can add something like the EDTA, which is a chelating reagent. Ch check in the, you guys have used it before, ethylene, diamine, tetraacetic acid or tetraacetate, or tetraacetic acid actually. You, you know, we, we know that EDTA tends to bind, you know, calcium preferentially, you know, meaning the KF, the formation constant, is fairly high, meaning that if at all you've got the sulfates and the phosphates there and you add the EDTA, you know, calcium will preferentially react with the EDTA, but we know that the ionization um, the, 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 the ionization um, um, temperature um, or, or the ionization energy, really, you know, of calcium EDTA is a lot lower, you know, than, say, calcium phosphate, meaning you don't need very high temperatures, actually, you know, to cause the atomization, or rather, the, I should have said the bond energy between the calcium and the EDTA is not as high, and so you don't need very high temperatures. And so because of that, you know, sort of, you are releasing, you know, the calcium and making it available, you know, for easy atomization. Now, also, you know, you can add other types of uh, cations, say something like lanthanum, that preferentially, you know, react with things like, you know, phosphates. And that way, 
you know, you are making the calcium available, you know, for atomization because it would not uh, have been bound, you know, by the phosphate ions, okay? You know, so you can add some of these releasing agents, you know, so that you can uh, mitigate uh, for matrix um, interferences in your sample. Another approach you can take, you know, is where you use a high temperature flame or even atomizer, you know, such as the ICP. You know, the ICP, the temperatures are very, very high, as you're going to see in a couple of slides to come, you know, like 6,000 uh, degrees Kelvin. And so you'll be able to easily atomize almost anything. But of course, we know ICP is fairly expensive, so sometimes you only have the AAS in the lab, you know, which is going to have a problem, or the flame is going to have a problem. Uh, uh, atomizing things like the calcium phosphate and so on. You know, so one solution, as I said, you know, is releasing agents. But another thing that you can do that's a very, very common problem, especially when you're doing AAS, atomic absorption spectroscopy, is, is this type of interference, you know, referred to as ionization interference, okay? You know, remember, with AAS, you know, you want to atomize your sample, all right, but you don't want the temperature to be high enough, you know, to ionize your sample, you know, and the reason is, you know, say you, if at all you've got a metal such as M, now if you look at, um, you, you know, the spectral lines, you know, of M, they're actually fairly different from the spectral lines, you know, of the oxidized form, you know, of the higher oxidation state, you know, of M, so, 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 so the spectral lines, you know, are different. So if at all you're doing, you know, something like um, uh, atomic absorption spectroscopy or even atomic emission spectroscopy, you know, ideally you do not want to do ionization of your sample. You just want to atomize your sample. On the other hand, if at all you're doing mass spectroscopy, you know, say the ICPMS, of course, in that case, you really want to ionize your sample. So you can see the fine line. But are you are doing ICP, atomic emission spectroscopy, you do not want ionization. And so in that case, it becomes an interfering species, you know, because the ions are going to have different spectral lines. So how do you solve this problem? So the way you solve this problem is by spiking your sample with an ionization suppressor, suppressor you know, which is a chemical reagent, you know, that is a preferentially ionizable relative to your analyte, okay? I'll give you an example. You know, if at all you're dealing, say, with uh, analysis of, um, you, you know, so, something like calcium, you, you know, which can be ionized as well, you know, you can spike it, you know, with something like uh, an alkali metal, you know, such as potassium or even cesium, you, you know, because we know alkali metals, you know, their ionization energies, you know, are a lot higher or rather a lot lower, you know, than the ionization energy, you know, of the alkali earth metals. And so because of that, you know, the spiked, um, you know, ionization suppressor really, you know, it's going to undergo ionization faster, you know, than, um, you, you know, the analyte of interest, okay? And because of that, you know, using uh, Richetarius principle, you know, you're going to see that you've got now an excess of electrons, you know, that are coming from, you know, whatever you spiked. And because of that, you know, the, um, you, you know, the equilibrium, you know, sort of shifts to the left, you know, for the analyte, and so that means you preserve, you know, the analyte, you know, from ionization. And I hope it's fairly clear. Again, by spiking it to the ionizer suppressor, you know, something like, you know, an alkali uh, metal, you know, that is very easily ionized, you know, this reaction happens, and so you get an excess of electrons, you know, because you've got a lot of ionization taking pl place of what you have spiked, and as you well know, you know, with the Lichitarius principle, if at all, you know, you get an increase, you know, in concentration, you know, on one side, you know, that forces, you know, the reaction, you know, to go in the direction, you know, where you've got, you know, less of the reactants, okay? And, and so ionization suppresses, 
you know, are typically used, again, if at all you are doing atomic um, a, a, a emission spectroscopy or even atomic absorption spectroscopy. You know, for example, you know, in this slide, you know, you're trying to measure strontium and, you know, you're adding potassium, as I said, it's an alkali metal, you know, it's fairly easily ionized. You know, as you can see, you know, as you increase the concentration of potassium that you spiked, you can see how steep your calibration is becoming. And as you well know, you know, the slope of a calibration is equivalent to calibration sensitivity, you know, meaning, you know, that, um, you, you, you know, your method is becoming a lot more sensitive, you, you know, because of the spike of potassium, which, as I said, you know, is an ionization suppressor. Of course, we all know that uh, the other option of dealing with chemical matrices, as you guys well know, you know, is to do standard addition. Standard addition. Again, I remember that. Um, if at all you're dealing with a very high matrix environment, and you guys did it, you know, with analysis of copper in beer, you, you know, you can do standard addition you know, to correct, you know, for matrix, um, for matrix effects, okay? Now, one other problem that, that you, you're gonna face um, is, especially when you're dealing with AES, atomic emission spectroscopy, is spectral interferences. And I think I remember talking to you guys when we were doing ICP OES, and you are analyzing zinc, you're analyzing copper, you're analyzing lead, you know, in brass. And if you look at, you know, the spectral lines of zinc, you know, you've got multiple spectral lines, say 335, 339, and 520. Copper, you know, has got fairly similar spectral lines, maybe 340 and so on. Lead has got other spectral lines. And so if at all you're dealing with a sample that contains lots of different matrices, a lot of different analytes as well, you tend to have this problem of spectral, you know, interferences. So the way you do that really is to assess what's potentially present, you know, so that when you are selecting, you know, the analytical spectra, you, you know, the type of wavelengths that you're actually going to use, you try to stay away, you know, from the spectral lines, you know, uh, from matrices, you know. So again, you have to look at... Um, or understand your type of sample so that when you're making up the method, you know, you can solve, you know, this challenge, you know, spectral interferences. So that brings us to the end of interferences. So remember, we've talked about chemical interferences and the way to solve them, you know, using ionization suppressors, releasing agents, you know, but also doing, you know, something like a standard addition. But also you've got, you know, the spectral interferences, you know, that comes from the multiplex of different types of signals, you know, that are coming from your sample. And again, the way really to correct for that is just purely by looking at your method, understanding, uh, you know, the type of sample that you're analyzing and choosing, you know, your spectral lines, analytical spectral lines carefully you know, so that they are far away, you know, from the matrix or spectral lines. So the last few slides, you know, we're going to talk about, um, you, you know, other different types of atomizers. I think you've heard me talk now a lot about the flame. You know, we've talked a lot about the furnace, you know, which we talked about. You know, now we're going to talk about, you know, the ICP or the plasma, you know, type of uh, as, uh, atomizer, which is sort of, you know, the gold standard, you know, when you're doing atomic emission, you know, spectrometer. The reason why it really it's a gold standard, especially ICP and DCP, is because you can see the temperatures are very, very high, meaning it's fairly easy to cause atomization and excitation of your analyte because after the analytes get excited, you know, you get uh, it to relax and it emits uh, the spectral lines that you are detecting. 
So hopefully it's clear, you know, the difference between AAS, you know, and AES. And again, go back and look at the Jablowski diagram that we talked a lot previously. AES is referring to, you, you know, the relaxation of the excited uh, atom, relaxing back to the ground state and giving you off, you know, those uh, uh, spectral lines, you know, that you are detecting. And then you can see, you know, it's, it's based on this, you know, that, uh, you, you know, you're, you're, you're heating the sample, you, you know, it's getting um, dissolvated, but also, you know, it, it's getting atomized and, and dissolvated, of course, you know, and then you're getting the excitation, and from the excitation, it relaxes back, you know, to the ground state uh, to give you of light, you know, that you're detecting, you know, as your signal. Okay. Now, the most common, again, type of um, atomizer, you know, for atomic emission spectroscopy is what you refer to as a plasma. And a plasma is an electrically conducting gaseous mixture, you know, with abundance, you know, of cations and electrons. And you're going to talk about, you know, how you actually create a plasma, you know, which you guys already saw, you know, in the lab. The most important thing is that, you know, the plasma temperatures are fairly high, 6,000, even up to 10,000 uh, degrees Kelvin, meaning that, that they can break down, you know, any type of recalcitrant, you know, or, or very highly stable type of, um, type of molecules or salts, you know, that you really want uh, to atomize. So, as you can see, atomic emission uh, spectroscopy compared to AES, you know, there are lots of advantages of AES. You know, one of it, of course, is fewer chemical interferences. Why? You know, the temperature of plasma is very, very high, and, and so it breaks down, you know, literally, you know, any types of chemical interferences that are present. And this explains to you, really, why you don't really need to care you know, to do standard addition when you're dealing with plasma because it breaks down, you know, the matrices, the, the, the temperature breaks down, you know, the matrices. So you don't really need to do standard addition when you're dealing with ICP. Now, one other advantage is that you've got a very high dynamic range. And of course, all of us understand what a dynamic range is. Another important thing is, you know, and this is very important, you can analyze multiple elements, you know, at the same time, okay? Remember, AES can only analyze one single element at a time. AES, you can analyze almost everything in the periodic table, you know, at the same time. Now, a couple of disadvantages, of course, you know, AES, as ICP, for example, OES is about 100K, so fairly expensive. You know, compared to a flame AA, which is only around 30K, you know, so again, you can see there's a huge difference, you know, in cost. Now, one other slight challenge, you know, is the fact that you tend to get spectral interferences, you know, with the AES, which I talked to you previously, and you need to look at your method uh, carefully. So there are different types of plasmas, you know, that you can use. Now, the most common is the ICP, and, and I'm going to discuss, you know, how it's generated. And another fairly common, um, you know, type is a direct current plasma. And there's an advantage and disadvantage of using either the ICP, you know, or the DCP. But you can also generate, really, plasmas using microwaves, you know. But again, the temperatures are not too high, and as such, it's not a very, very common, actually, um, uh, uh, atomizer, you, you know, for AES. So, in fact, it's typically used, you know, as, as a detector, you know, for gas chromatography. So, microwave-induced plasmas are not very, very common, you know, for atomic spectroscopy. But ICP is the most common, and to some extent, you know, DCP can be used as well. So let's quickly discuss, you know, how you actually, you know, generate uh, the ICP. So you generate it, you know, you generate the plasma, the inductively coupled plasma, you know, using, you know, a torch, you know, that looks 
a plasma torch, you know, that looks like that. And in the plasma torch, you know, you've got, um, you, you, you've got the sample aerosol, but you also have argon, argon, you know, that is going through, you know, that plasma torch. So essentially, the source of the plasma, you know, is the argon. And so how do you generate, you know, the flame or the plasma? The flame is generated, you, you know, by passing argon, you know, through a radio frequency coil, okay? So you've got this radio frequency coil, and the radio frequency coil, you know, causes, you know, these argon, you know, to actually break down uh, or get ionized into argon, cation, you know, pr plus, you know, the electrons. And in fact, initially, you know, the way you ignite it is, 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 is by using the so-called Tesla, you know, Tesla coil, you know, which is not very different, you know, which is really the radio frequency coil. And a Tesla coil, really, you know, is just a high charge, um, a, a high voltage, a high voltage wire, or a high voltage, you know, coil wire. And because of that, you know, that causes, you know, the ionization of the argon, you know, into argon cations and argon electrons. Now, we also know that if at all you put a charged species, you know, such as this, in an electric field, you know, such as the radio frequency field, you know, it tends to collide, you know, with each other. They tend to deflect, you know, and collide, you know, with each other. And so, you, you know, you essentially put in a high, um, you, you essentially put in, you know, a high radio frequency uh, field, you know, uh, for, for the argon and the electrons. And there's a lot of collision, you know, that is actually taking place. And that collision, you know, causes, you know, the heat, you know, to actually get, uh, to actually get generated. And because of that, you know, you end up, you know, with a, with a plasma. So maybe this figure, you know, is going to explain, you know, all the steps, you know, in a step-by-step -step version. As I said, you know, you've got a Tesla coil, you know, which is really a high voltage um, carrying wire, you know, that causes uh, the ionization of the argon to argon cations and so on. And then you put it in a radio frequency environment. Um, and, and, and also sometimes you can add a magnetic field, you know, to increase the amount of collisions, you know, that are taking place. And because of those collisions, you know, you create or generate a lot of heat. And so in the end, you know, you've got a plasma, you know, being generated. Now take note of this, you know, you also have a, an auxiliary, you know, flow of argon, you know, which is actually used, you know, to cool the torch, you know, so you've got, you know, this argon here, you know, that is sort of being used as uh, the one that is generating the plasma, but you also have, you know, the tangential flow, you know, of argon that is used, you know, to cool the torch. And as such, you know, you, pro you actually consume, you know, a lot of argon, you know, with the ICP, and argon is not, uh, is, is not inexpensive. So you can see that, that, that the total argon flow, you know, can range from 5 to 20 liters a minute, depending on the type of ICP instrument that you have. And so this becomes very costly, you know, to run. And that's why you saw us in the lab, actually, we had to pull all the samples together, you know, so that we reduce, you know, the amount of gas, you know, that we are using. So you, you can run the plasma in two modes, uh, as shown in this, um, in, in this figure. In, you, know, you can run it or angle you, you know, the plasma either in an axial mode or even in a radio mode. And that means you know, the relative position of the detector you know, to your plasma. Okay? Meaning, for example, in the, in the radio mode, you know, your your, your torch looks like that, and then the detector, you know, typically would be at right angles. The detector would be at, yeah, the detector would be at right angles, you know, to the to 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 the to to, to the plasma. Okay. 
in the axial design, you know, this is where you've got to rotate the torch, you know, such that the detector, you can see it's in line, you know, to the, to the tongue, you know, to the tongue of the plasma. So you can see this one, it's in line, you know, 180 degrees. And then these ones sort of, you know, the tongue here, you know, it's at right angles at 90 degrees, you know, to the detector. Okay. Now, why do you need to do that? You, you know, you're going to see with the radio design, which is very commonly used, you know, when you're dealing with a very dirty matrix, you know, such as in metallurgy and so on, you tend to get, you know, fewer spectral interferences, okay? Because you don't get a lot of, um, you know, this plasma light, you know, hitting the detector, you know, because sort of, you know, it's in, at right angles, okay? On the other hand, you know, with the axial design, you know, you tend to get more spectral lines, you know, or, or rather even matrices, you know, because you've got this uh, flame, you know, sort of also heating, heating sort of your, 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 your detector. But the good thing with doing it this way, you, you tend to get lower detection limits, you know, higher precision, you know, and so forth. And so it's fairly good, you know, if at all you're doing it, you know, for environmental analytics or you're doing it for ICP because the temperatures here also tend to be higher, you know, so ionization is better, you know, if at all you're running uh, the plasma in an axial, in an axial mode. So again, think about, you know, those two different types of modes and their relative advantages and disadvantages. Again, you can see here, you know, the temperature is lower with the radio and that's why you're getting fewer uh, spectral lines, you know, which can be a good thing if at all you're dealing with a very dirty, you know, type of matrix. You know, so what are some of the quick features of the ICP OES? And OES stands for Optical Emission Spectroscopy, which is not different from the AES. So sometimes we'll call it ICP AES or ICP OES. So you can see that it's got fairly good, you know, uh, detection limits. The detection limits really, you know, depend on the type of nebulizer actually that you use. Meaning if at all you use an ultrasonic nebulizer, you know, you tend to get better limits of detection compared to when you use just a regular pneumatic nebulizer, like what we used in the lab, the cross flow, you know, uh, it tends to have lower or rather higher limit of detection. The ultrasonic nebulizer just largely means that you've got a crystal and the crystal, you know, is vibrating. People call it a pizza electric crystal, you know, that is vibrating. And then you've got droplets, you know, of your solution heating that crystal. And of course, they break down, you know, into a mist. You know, that's what ultrasonic nebulization means. Okay. So you can see nebulizer plays a very significant role. You know, other features of the ICP, you can see it's fairly expensive, you know, to purchase. But it's also fairly expensive to operate, you know, because of the amount of argon, you know, that you consume in a minute. Now, one huge advantage, you know, like I said, you know, you can actually use it, you know, for multi-element analysis, you know, which is very good. Compared to AES, you know, of course, ICP OES has got a much wider dynamic range. Of course, compared to AAS, you know, it's got very few potential chemical interferences because the temperatures here, you know, are fairly high. But I would say the biggest advantage possibly is that the ability to do multi-element analysis, which is really impossible when you're dealing with AAS. Now, it's important, you know, to remember that you need the temperature of the ICP, you know, to be very, very stable because it really, you know, affects, you know, your signal. In fact, you're totally dependent, you know, on the temperature being stable, you know, for you to get good precision. And the basis for that is because of this so-called Boltzmann distribution. And, and Boltzmann distribution, you know, just describes the relative proportion 
of atoms, you know, that are present in the ground state relative, you know, to those that are present, you know, in the excited state. Of course, for ICPOES, we want the majority of the atoms to be in an excited state, that's ICPOES. Whereas in atomic absorption spectroscopy, we want the majority, you know, of the atoms to be actually present, you know, in the ground state, okay? And based on Boltzmann distribution, you know, you can actually calculate, you know, the relative proportion of that. And that is also based on proportional rather to the degeneracy. And degeneracy really means, you know, the excited states, you know, that are available, you know, for that atom, you know, or electrons of the atom to transition to. Okay. So meaning, if for example, you're dealing with sodium, you, you know, where... You, you know, you've got, uh, say, the three S electrons, you know, being the outermost, um, uh, the, 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 the valence electrons. And then, of course, you've got the three P, you know, fairly close, you know, to the three S, meaning electrons. These electrons can transition from the ground state, you know, to an excited state, you know, on the three P orbital, you know, that is not in the case of sodium in that case. And... Based on, you, you know, the, 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 the number of uh, electrons that you can occupy, um, you know, in the P orbital relative to the S, that is what is referred to as the degeneracy, okay? All right. And, and that is what I've shown you here, you know, say in the ground state, if at all it's an S orbital, you know, it can only occupy really two electrons. And then in that case, you know, uh, if at all is excited, you know, then you've got three degenerate um, sort of, um, you know, orbitals, you know, for the P. And, 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 and so that's what you've got, the degeneracy there. Now, the delta E refers to that energy gap, you know, between the two states, you know, the, the ground state and the excited state. K, you know, is just a constant, a Boltzmann constant, you know, and temperature you know, really the temperature of your atomizer. Meaning, if at all you've got a situation like this, you, you know, where you've got sodium atoms, you know, and you're using a flame, the temperature is not very, very high, and you, you are exciting the electrons probably, you know, from, you, you know, the 3S to the 3P, and the degeneracy in this case is 2, the degeneracy of that is 1, uh, you know, then the others are constants, really. And when you do your calculations, you know, you can see that, um, uh, you, 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 you know, the n star over the n zero is equal to that. And when you change it to 2610 Kelvin, you know, you see the temperature, uh, or rather the n star over the n zero, you know, becomes this. Now, you can see that these numbers are not very different. You know, the 1.67 times 10 to power minus 4 is very, very close, you know, to 1.74 times 10 to power minus 4. You know, they don't look very, very significant because they mean, you, you know, that largely in either case, you've got about 99.98%, all right? you know, of, um, you know, the atoms, really, in the ground state, okay? And so the 10 Kelvin difference, the 10 degrees Kelvin difference, you know, really doesn't affect, you know, the population of the atoms in the ground state, okay? But if you look at atomic emission spectroscopy, you, you know, between uh, th those two temperatures, and you take the difference, you know, between these two numbers and you divide it, say, by that number, then you're going to see that just this 10 uh, degrees Kelvin, you know, causes an increase of 4%, all right, between this and this, be between these, these two numbers. You, you know, meaning that, that, that the 10 degrees Kelvin causes a 4% increase, you know, in the number of uh, atoms, you know, at an excited state, yeah, meaning that the temperature needs to be very, very stable, you know, when you're dealing with the AES, because it really affects, you know, the population of the atoms, you know, that are present at an excited state. 
And as such, you know, with AES, you need a very, very stable, you know, type of, uh, type of uh, atomizer. Otherwise, precision, you know, is going to be poor. So we've already talked about the ICP, you know, the other type of uh, plasma, you know, that you can actually use is a so-called DCP, the direct current plasma. And typically the configuration of the torch, you know, looks like that. You know, you've got uh, three sets of electrodes, you know, that looks almost like an inverted Y. You've got the cathode block, you know, you've got, you know, the anode. And two sets of anode, really, you know, which are made out of carbon, made out of graphite. And then you've got the sample, you know, and the argon, you know, sort of in between. And the way you cause um, ionization, you know, or the plasma, you know, to actually form in, in this case is by electros, uh, is, 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 is by short circuiting the system where you bring the cathode you know, into a momentary, you know, connection, you know, with these anodes. So you bring them into connection, all right? And by doing so, you know, you are causing the arcing, you know, so there's a spark. And, and that spark really, you know, causes, you know, this type of ionization, you know, to actually, to actually take place. And, you know, a plasma, you know, is generated because, of course, you're dealing with fairly high voltage, they're fairly high voltage electrodes. And because a spark, you know, is fairly significant and that causes, you know, the plasma, you know, to actually get generated. Now, compared to the ICP, you know, the temperatures in this case are a bit lower, but you also use less argon. You also use less argon for the DCP, meaning, you know, that, the temp uh, that you, you tend to get fewer spectral lines, you know, for the DCP as well. So very quickly, ICP compared to the DCP, you know, the advantages and the disadvantages. ICP, you know, you use a lot of argon, so that's not very good. You've got more spectral lines, it's good and bad. You know, if at all, because of course, of the metrics interferences, which can be a problem. Um, you, you know, we've got fewer lines with the DCP and so on. Now, DCP can handle more dirty samples as well. ICP, you can't really handle dirty samples at all because of the clogging problems and, and so on. So the way you operate an ICP OES, you know, because you're dealing with lots of um, wavelengths in terms of the spectral lines, okay? Because, I mean, that's why you're detecting multiple analytes. So how do you detect multiple analytes? based on the detector, you know, you can either run the ICP using the so-called sequential mode. And the sequential mode, as I said before, you know, is where you keep changing the angle of the grating, you know, and the angle of the grating, you know, really means that, um, you, you know, the spectral lines, um, different spectral lines, you know, end up in the detector you know, as you keep, you know, changing, you know, sort of the dispersive element, you know, meaning the grading. But the problem with doing that is that you're sampling only one line at a time, while at the same time you're consuming a lot of sample as you're scanning. People call it scanning. As you're scanning, you know, the instrument, you know, so that you can get to all the different spectral lines. Now, a, a better approach, you know, is where you make the exit slit fairly wide. And instead of just using one detector, you use a multiplex of detectors called polychromators, which we discussed earlier, you know, things like the CCD. And in that case, you know, the analyte uh, spectral lines, all of them get detected uh, simultaneously. So it's, you know, it saves you time, you know, but also it saves you you, you know, the sample as well. And so most instruments, you know, like the one you guys used in the lab, actually used a CCD. So you're not actually scanning, but instead, you know, you're doing um, a simultaneous detection. So take note, you know, of those two different uh, modes. And lastly, you, you know, I think it's always important to remember the detection limits um, of atomic spectrometers 
you know, be able to compare relatively, you know, uh, the detection limits, you know, of different types of spectrometers, say the flame AA, the furnace AA, you know, the plasma emission spectrometer, you know, and the plasma uh, mass spectrometer. And you can see, you know, that in general, you know, the plasma mass spec, of course, is a lot more sensitive, you know, very, very low limits of detection. And the flame AA really is not very good, uh, you know, because the limits of detection are not very good. Also look at, you know, things like the advantages, the purchase cost, sample throughput, and so on. Because as you go to the industry, you're going to realize, you know, one of your major role as an analytical chemist really, you know, is to make decisions, you know, on which analytical method, you know, should actually be used. And so these are the metric, uh, you know, figures of merit really. You know that you need that to pay attention to figures of merit that you need to pay attention to, and then lastly, you know, as you well know, if you end up designing an atomic emission spectrometer, you know, you need to be reminded of, of the different, I, 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 I guess, ideal conditions or properties that you are looking for. You know, for an emission spectrometer, and, and, and almost for any instrument out there. You know, good resolution, you, you know, wide dynamic range, very sensitive, you know, and so on. And, and of course, going forward, you know, you're going to see in future, you, you know, miniaturization. It's going to be a big deal. Ability to miniaturize instruments, to be able to take them to the field would be a good uh, thing to have. And also the operation cost. You know, you're going to see one thing that they're trying to do in the industry is to try to reduce you know, the, cons the consumption of argon, you know, because it's the biggest challenge, you know, that we have, you know, with emission spectrometers, particularly the ICP, where they're just too expensive, you know, to operate, you know, because of the amount of argon that is being consumed. And so you're going to see some instruments out there, or some manufacturers out there trying instead, you know, to generate plasma, you know, using something like uh, the air, okay? It's a new instrument out there. The problem is air doesn't give you a very uh, give you a very high temperature plasma, and also causes, of course, the oxidation of your of, of your samples, which is not a good thing. Uh, whereas argon, you know, we, we well know that it's an inert gas, you know, so it causes a very inert environment when you're doing spectroscopy, you know, which is a good thing. So that brings us to the end, really, of uh, spectroscopy in, um, in general, especially atomic uh, spectroscopy. In the next chapter, you know, a small chapter, really, that we're going to talk about, you know, next time is voltammetry.